Hi everyone, Frank Kim here, and today I'll be showing you the element sulfur. Now when you think of sulfur, you usually think of volcanoes, bad smells, and pyrotechnics. Volcanoes are where we get our elemental yellow sulfur. Now, elemental sulfur itself, as the yellow powder here, isn't too bad, but the compounds it forms, such as sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, are completely rank. You know, even if there's just trace concentrations of it, you notice the strong smell of rotten eggs or a acrid choking odor. In fact, um, ethane thiol, basically alcohol with an S SH group instead of an OH group, is what is added to propane to make it smell bad so that you know if it's leaking before you actually light a match. Sulfur is useful in pyrotechnics because it easily liquefies and evaporates to create gas pressure as well as reacts with metals and oxidizers to release heat. So let's get to the periodic table. So, sulfur is found right here on the periodic table. Sulfur is element number 16, right below oxygen and right next to chlorine. Sulfur is located in what's known as the calcogens group. Now, calcogens, like oxygen and sulfur, have six valence electrons, meaning they want to take two electrons from metals or other nonmetals to form compounds. Now, as I said earlier, elemental sulfur itself doesn't smell too bad, but the compounds it makes are absolutely horrible. So, at standard atmospheric temperature and pressure, Sulfur forms uh, crown-shaped rings of eight sulfur atoms, as shown here. When you heat sulfur to liquefy it, it breaks into chains of eight sulfur. Uh, one of the major things I, found, I find so interesting about sulfur is that it actually changes color when you melt it. Not very many substances do that. I think this is due to the fact that sulfur breaks into chains and alters its atomic structure, therefore altering the color. A sulfur is violently reactive with metals, especially if the metal is powdered. For example, sulfur reacts with zinc to create zinc sulfide. Now, in the atmosphere, sulfur burns to produce sulfur dioxide, and let me be honest with you, I hate sulfur dioxide. It burns your respiratory tract, it smells, it's colorless, it's nasty stuff. Sulfur dioxide reacts with water to produce sulfurous acid, an intermediate in the acid rain formation. And then this unstable sulfurous acid reacts with oxygen to form sulfuric acid, which lowers the pH of the rain, therefore lowering the pH of any body of water exposed to said rain. Now, sulfides that are formed when metals react with sulfur can react with acid to form the smell of rotten eggs, hydrogen sulfide. Also quite toxic. You don't want to you don't want to expose yourself to too much of this stuff. All right, so here's typical crystalline sulfur you'll find around volcanoes. Sulfur is often crushed into a powder to make it easier to use for reactions. Now before I actually melt the sulfur, the sulfur may ignite while I'm heating it to produce sulfur dioxide and I don't want to be breathing that. So I'm going to put my respirator on. So, now I've got my respirator on, put my goggles on with that, definitely don't want this in my eyes. I'm going to start melting the sulfur. Get you a better angle on that. Now, as the sulfur heats up, you see it begin to form a, first a yellow liquid, before the rings actually break up, and then a red liquid, as the rings break up into sulfur-8 chains, altering the atomic structure and therefore the color. The sulfur will begin turning black as it heats more and more, and it becomes sort of a Sort of a molten plastic like substance.
The sulfur is now fully molten. So as you can see, after further heating, the sulfur has begun turning black and becoming sort of a, a viscous, plastic-like substance. So let's turn the heat off. Now this uh, red liquid sulfur and um, black plastic sulfur is not stable under standard atmospheric temperature and pressure, so slowly this will convert back into yellow sulfur 8 rings. So let's do a few reactions with sulfur. Alright, so next I'm going to mix some zinc powder and sulfur powder and watch the reaction. And then I'm going to be burning sulfur in standard atmospheric oxygen concentration, which is only about 20% oxygen. Alright, so now I have the um, zinc and the sulfur mixed at the stoichiometric ratio of 1 gram of zinc to 0.49 grams of sulfur. So I'm going to mix this up. So now that I've got the um, sulfur and the zinc mixed thoroughly, let's go out back and watch the reactions. So now we're outside. I'm going to start by igniting a bit of sulfur in the surrounding oxygen. It is raining a little bit, so hopefully it will still ignite. Porch. I don't know how well you can see it from here, but sulfur burns with a very pale blue color. Let me zoom in on it a bit. It's only visible at night. Now later on I'm going to burn some sulfur in pure oxygen and it will burn a lot brighter. Let's get to the Zinc sulfur mixture next. Ooh, I can smell the sulfur dioxide from here. So next, let's watch Zinc's reaction with sulfur. Uh, sulfur reacts very violently with zinc as you can see and you may have seen a hint of green there that is because we are producing zinc sulfide and has the phosphorescent properties that we use in um, that we use in for example glow paste or little glow in the dark toys phosphorescent materials basically what they do is they absorb light and re-emit it slowly causing them to glow so, let's prepare a flask full of pure oxygen and burn sulfur in that. Okay, so I've got the materials I need to produce pure oxygen. Let me put on my respirator real quick since I'll be standing rather close to this um, beaker while I'm producing sulfur dioxide. Now, to produce pure oxygen gas, I'm going to use a redox reaction between drugstore hydrogen peroxide and Potassium permanganate. I'll explain the reaction in further detail later on, but essentially the reaction produces a lot of pure oxygen gas very fast. It's commonly used in the elephant toothpaste reaction. So, let's add a generous amount of hydrogen peroxide. Make sure the whole thing fills with oxygen. I'll have to worry about limiting the amount of oxygen I produce since it's not horribly toxic. And let's add a nice excess of potassium permanganate. So, that is a mixture of steam from a bit of heating and pure oxygen. So before this all blows away, 
Let's ignite some sulfur and lure it in. Here's the sulfur. Sulfur's burning. As you can see, sulfur burns much brighter than pure oxygen. Due to the higher concentration of reactants, the reaction becomes faster and more energetic. Let me produce a bit more oxygen. Got some more pure oxygen in there. Heat up the sulfur again before the cell blows away. Blur it in. Ah, it all blew away. Alright, so here's some more pure oxygen. Light up the surface. And lower it in. I may get better results if I do this inside. So, that the so before I finish up, I'm going to show you one more fun experiment with sulfur. I'm going to show you how to grow sulfur crystals. In this case, they are monoclinic needle-shaped crystals. So to do this, you need to dissolve sulfur and get it to crystallize back out. Now, sulfur doesn't like to dissolve in very many things, but it will dissolve in hot toluene. So you can get it simply by buying it from the hardware store in these metal containers. So the solubility of sulfur and toluene is about um, 100 grams per liter. So I'm going to add 500 milliliters of toluene and 50 grams of sulfur. So on this hot plate, I've got a 500 milliliter flask. I'm going to start by adding 500 milliliters of toluene. is about 500 milliliters and now let me dry this off a bit so now I'm going to add 50 grams of sulfur powder So the solution looks cloudy right now, but as the solution heats up, more and more sulfur will dissolve. The solution is now roughly 60 degrees Celsius, and the solution is clearing up as more and more of the sulfur suspended dissolves. The solution is now roughly 70 degrees Celsius, and it has cleared up as, as more and more of the sulfur is dissolving. Now, we want to keep heating this uh, solution until all the solid sulfur on the bottom dissolves. And that should happen at roughly 100 degrees Celsius. The solution has now reached 100 degrees Celsius and all of the sulfur is dissolved, yielding a yellow solution. So now I'm going to take this off of the heat. Get a towel. Alright, so I've placed this beaker on a towel and over the next few minutes the sulfur should crystallize out as monoclinic needle-shaped crystals. Now, sulfur is soluble in toluene at high temperatures as you saw in the uh, as you saw moments ago, but at low temperatures sulfur will not dissolve in toluene. So this forces the sulfur to crystallize out. All right, the solution is now roughly 50 degrees Celsius, and I'm beginning to see the first sulfur crystals precipitate out. Let me move the camera. Now, 
Now as the solution cools more and more, more of that sulfur will crystallize back out. As the solution cools further, I'm beginning to notice tiny rhombic crystals of sulfur forming at the bottom. Right here. Now it appears that these tiny rhombic crystals of sulfur act as seeds for the monoclinic needle-shaped crystals of sulfur. So what's happening here is the sulfur is first, um, first grabbing onto itself to precipitate out of the solution as a rhombic crystal, and then more sulfur molecules grab onto that rhombic crystal and precipitate out as these needle crystals. The solution is continuing to cool, and I'm observing that the crystals are first precipitating at the bottom, where the solution is cooling fastest. Now that the top layer of the solution has cooled down enough to begin precipitating crystals out, um, the bottom of the solution cooled much faster and started precipitating first, while the top of the solution was still above 50 degrees Celsius. So, now that the top layer of the solution has reached uh, 50 degrees Celsius, you can see tiny crystals of sulfur precipitating out of the solution right there. So, the way this is working scientifically is sulfur is a nonpolar substance. Since um, sulfurate molecules are comprised all of the same element, then the electrons are shared evenly. That means that the molecule has no overall charge. Now, toluene is a hydrocarbon. Um, it's just a long chain of a bunch of carbons and hydrogens all bound together. Now, carbon and hydrogen have roughly equal, um, actually completely equal electronegativities. So, neither carbon nor hydrogen really win the tug of war of electrons. So, hydrocarbons like toluene are also nonpolar. So, when sulfur comes into contact with hot toluene, the toluene basically surrounds the sulfur and, and, uh, dissolves it into the solution. Now sulfur cannot dissolve in water because water is polar. It's got a positive and a negative end and there's just nothing for those um, two charges to grab onto since sulfur has a neutral charge. The solution is cooled further and more of the sulfur is crystallized back out. Now, I've formed thousands of tiny little monoclinic crystals of sulfur that have all fallen onto the bottom. The solution is roughly 35 degrees Celsius now. Alright, the solution is now nearing room temperature and most of the sulfur is crystallized back out. The solution should become a clear color again once all of it is crystallized out. So here's my result. thousands of tiny needle-shaped sulfur crystals. It appears that on the sides, larger sulfur crystals grew where the solution was cooling quickly, and in the middle where the solution was cooling slowly, little tiny amounts of sulfur crystallized back out at a time and fell back down to the bottom. Now, here's the result of my smaller scale test I did before I made this video. Let me bring that into the light. Now it appears that in my smaller scale test, I got larger sulfur crystals. Now, I believe this happened because I was using a larger surface area of sulfur in the smaller scale test here. I may have formed smaller sulfur crystals here because um, there's a lot more toluene to heat up here, and I had a bigger surface, and I had a smaller surface area of sulfur, so the sulfur may have melted before it actually dissolved, and that may have caused it to form smaller crystals. Now, this is just an educated guess as to what might have happened, but if you guys know anything about this, um, let me know in the comments. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you in the next video.